welcome Global Action Coach community. I'd like to say good afternoon or good morning or good evening depending on your location in the world. I'm E. Sabros, Online Marketing Manager in the Las Vegas Headquarter Office for Action Coach. It's very nice to see so many of you on this webinar today and Happy New Year's 2014 to everyone. I know it's going to be a great year for all. Today's webinar is on answers to most frequently asked DISC questions with Dr. Tony Alessandra and Ms. Carol Dysart of MSC Council. I'd like to begin by giving you some background on Dr. Tony Alessandra, who is CEO of Assessments24x7.com, a company that offers online 360-degree assessments. Dr. Alessandra is author of 28 books and featured in over 100 audio, video programs and films. Recognized by Meetings and Conventions magazines as one of America's most electrifying speakers, he was inducted into the Speakers Hall of Fame in 1985 and most recently the Sales Hall of Fame in 2010. Now without further delay, I'd like to turn you over to Dr. Tony Alessandra. Well, thank you, Eve. I appreciate it. Let me introduce Carol Dysart. Carol has been a friend and colleague of mine since 1979 when we first met in San Diego. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, Carol actually sold me my first Apple II computer back in the late 70s. Uh, now, they say it takes a minimum of 10,000 hours of study and practice to become a master at anything. So calling Carol the disk guru or a disk master is certainly an understatement. Ever since I've known Carol, she's been engaged specifically on the subject of how to interpret and apply DISC in business, and she has clients all over the world. I highly recommend Carol's DISC certifications, and I often call on her expertise to fine-tune things in our own DISC reports. Now, Carol's the author of several books on DISC, and her People Smart Solutions method as designed to enhance people's ability to understand themselves, appreciate the differences in others, and to make changes when they want different results than they're currently getting. In other words, she helps people become more people smart. So welcome, Carol, and it's great to have you on this call. So tell me, what is it that, that's kept you so interested in DISC for so many years? <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Tony. Hi, Action Coaches. I just, um, I so love getting to talk about DISC. So what has kept me interested is it's all about people. I'm a people person, but when I found the DISC system, I didn't invent it. I would love to have, but when I discovered about it in 1979, it had just been released, and I immediately saw its accuracy when I took my first profile, and I went, how did it get all these good answers? And I only gave it a few you know, a few of those, and I realized that this was a key. I had been teaching high school and college for several years. What I needed for my students, I could see that this is what people needed to know about themselves. So I just kept exploring it uh, deeper and deeper and deeper, and when I went to a program that was using DISC in their curriculum just the next year, I went, oh my gosh, they recognize this too. So I became their DISC master, and I provided them as a They've been my client for over 34 years now. So it's like there's never an end to the people questions that people get, and I'm the resource, I guess. Absolutely, Carol. I, I actually I turn to you a lot when uh, I have uh, some in-depth questions that I just can't answer myself. But let, let's kind of go into some of the questions that, okay. that we've had people ask over the years. Uh, uh, the first one, obviously, as you have it up here, is what makes DISC so popular, particularly in the business world? Yes, it, it was a, a winning product I could see from the beginning because it's short. It only takes 10 to 15 minutes to fill in. It's all about you, which is everybody's favorite topic. And for business, it literally in 10 minutes, if you were to ask a new employee and say, uh, tell me everything about you, what motivates you, your strengths, your overuses, your weaknesses, how to communicate with you, they could not write you up a document in 10 or 15 or 30 or probably several days. 
So in 10 minutes, it gives you an operator's manual. So a manager now can see who is on the team, how to strengthen their weaknesses if needed, but mainly to step into their strengths. So it, sees, it helps people see what works about them. And you can imagine when you're with a boss and they're acknowledging you for your strengths, doesn't that feel great about you? It gives the bosses like an inside x-ray to, to know what to say, how to motivate them, how to manage. It also lets you be in control of your default style. What I mean by that is we all have an instinctive knee-jerk response. And it's a blind spot to us until it's been pointed out. And once you can see what that blind spot is, usually an overuse that you give of a strength. And so that default style that has run other people away from you, I bet most of you can think of relationships you may have been less than happy with because you did something or they, they weren't the right person to pick or an employee. You know, the cost of a losing an employee is huge. So that default style gets in our way if we're not aware of it. Once we're aware of it, we have it, it doesn't have us. That's a key distinction. So you want to be in charge of your style, and then you can make choices. So this piece in, in, in your profile system, Tony, that I love is that communications, uh, it gives several references to how you like to be communicated with and how others should know that they should be giving you information and communications, and Absolutely. then it also teaches you how to do it with them. Yeah, that's the communication uh, do's and don'ts. Yes, yes. So that's the, and it anticipates the normal tensions. You've got a great system in there about what causes the tensions. Well, a fast-paced person is going to be different than a slower pace. They're going to think differently. They're going to have a different focus. So the tensions, when I'm trying to hurry you up, or I should really say, Tony, I've known you for so long, when you're trying to close, shut me down, <laughs> when you're trying to hurry me up and I'm talking, that could be a tension. I could go, doesn't he appreciate me? Well, I know he does, but he wants to move on. So you start to understand why people do what they do, and you don't take it personally. You just get it's their style. So the tension just dis disappears. Yeah, and Carol, I just want to – let me just add something here. <laughs> uh, this, this, really, this really is uh, an issue with me and Carol. Carol is a very, very high I, and I'm a high D. So uh, when Carol goes – a little too long on on topics. Uh, I do, you know, cut in. Yeah, and, do, uh, do, do. I give you yeah, full permission. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Go on. I'm sorry for. Next. Next. No. Go on. But the second question is, how old is Disc? Yes. Well, again, it wasn't invented with me, but Socrates and Pluto, Plato. Plato back. Plato. All the ancients noticed four distinctions. You hear about that in all the literature. Until the 20s, though, human interaction, human behavior was really not an issue in history. It may have been an issue, but nobody was studying it. Doctors Freud and Jung started to look at the psychological impact. They were studying the criminally insane in hospitals and trying to figure out how they got there and what, the, what was their makeup. Marston was a contemporary of Freud and Jung, and he, this is in the 20s now in the USA, and he is a behavioral scientist that was also very inventive, by the way. He was the one that invented later the lie detector. He invented uh, Wonder Woman, the character, so that women would have a superhero model. But he said there's something in the behaviors of normal people. What are the emotions that underlie those behaviors? Because he had noticed, finally, this dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance were technical behavioral words that literally told the story uh, of the pattern. And he said, for instance, the dominant patterns have certain needs, emotions, and fears. And that's when he really had the breakthrough thought that he would study normal people. So whenever you're administering coaches, whenever you're administering a profile, it's really important you first bring up this fact that this is a profile not to psychoanalyze you or to find out what's wrong with you. But it's all about the normal emotions of people and what drives their behavior and motivators so that you can be in alignment with them. So this is where we got the term, I invented it. I don't know if I did or not, but DISC literacy is one of the most important literacies. There's reading, writing, arithmetic, and people. So knowing DISC and being able to read the observable clues that tell the rest of the story about a person 
it tells what motivates their primary style. So that's that's the background. Okay, great. Uh, so what does DISC actually measure, Carol? So what it measures is our underlying emotions, needs, and fears. And if you look at this iceberg, it's the perfect picture that on top of the water, the ships can only go by what they see, unless they have great radar, sonar, radar. The, the iceberg underneath is so much bigger. And that is like people. We are the behavior you can see on the surface, that's what walks in the room. That's what sits down in their coworker's desk. That's what comes in the room with your teenagers and your family and your partners. But if you are disc literate, not just understanding what the four styles are, but how they think, how they operate, you will then have the keys to the kingdom. It's the okay. primary concern that's driving them, and then you can be in their space and be able to be people smart with them. Yeah, Carol, mm. uh, I just wanted to interject that uh, I like the iceberg analogy. And what I've heard uh, and, and actually have taught myself is that uh, what you can see above the surface, uh, that, part, that little part of the iceberg is the disk, you know, your actual behavior, how you do what you do. And below the surface, uh, that's measured by the motivator's assessment. Uh, the, the PIAV, uh, Personal Interests, Attitudes, and Values, which is why you do what you do. And when you can understand why people do what they do uh, through motivators and how they do what they do through DISC, you've got a pretty substantial picture of uh, what makes people tick. And people will think you have some sort of a um, crystal ball hidden under your jacket, you know. They're wondering, how do you know all this? Because one of the other things, like I love being able to relate to people by once I get their style quickly, whether they're a DIS or C, I can then complement them immediately in the language of what they're listening for. And we don't go into a lot of that on this call, but that's a lot of the stuff that I write about and in my training is that what is important. Like, so a high S, if I see a person I recognize by their dress, they're, they're kind of cautious, they're patient. I want to compliment them in some way. So I talk about, I'll bet you're really dependable. I'll bet you're, you, you, loyalty is a very important to you, isn't it? And they go, whoa, how did you know that? Because nothing they said was that. But as soon as you know they're an S, those are the primary tendencies of an S. Right, right, absolutely. So uh, why do people like DISC so much? I mean, it really is widely used, millions of them done every year. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned it before, um, they love their favorite topic, so people are always wondering, who am I, what am I, do I look good, who am I going to impress, but I, they like DISC, the profile, because there's a lot of different profiles and assessment systems, as we know, and I love that you carry so many on your system, but with DISC, the main questions are found in 10 simple minutes, or easy multiple choice questions. You're not answering a long, involved questionnaire. So the terms under DISC are easy to recall once you train yourself, dominance, influence, steadiness, compliance. They're logical and everything else. And it's a non-threatening profile. People are not threatened. And again, with the coaches, when you go to administer one, you have to let them know this is a non-threatening instrument that won't point out anything that's wrong with you. It'll show everything that's right and give you constructive ways to move and be stronger in your strengths. And then I love, what I love about this is the authenticity that comes out. As soon in a crowd, if you're with a group and when, I, when you debrief your client, companies, coaches, I hope you will do group debriefs because once everyone knows everyone else's style, they will then, you, they can make jokes about you. They always laugh about how eyes talk too much and these are too bottom line and these are too analytical. And they'll, they'll always point out the overuse of the strength. But once they know you're styling the group, they're, the, what I've found in corporations, the gossip disappears because yeah. now everyone tells one on themselves. You go around the room and there's a, a, you know, a way you can bring out what's great about that person. So absolutely comes as soon as one person's authentic, everyone gets to be authentic. It just yeah. works that way. Now, uh, let me add something before we move on to the next question. Uh, two things. 
Number one, uh, I, I don't know how many of the listeners know that you know, for the last almost 40 years, I've been a, a keynote speaker. And when I open a convention, whether it's a corporate convention or an association convention, and talk about DISC, one of the things that I suggest that the meeting planner or, or key exec uh, does is uh, uh, get four different color, uh, uh, you know, those round circles, those little, uh, I don't know what they are, they're, they're just like round dots, and uh, to put it on the name badges of everybody after, the, after my talk so that during the breaks and uh, the meals, people can see what color or what style they are, D, I, S, or C, and it really, really adds to the, uh, uh, to the hallway chatter, to the hallway uh, uh, talking. Very often you'll find that people who are in the same offices tend to cluster together and don't interact as much with people from other offices or other countries, but when you have those, uh, the D, I, S, C uh, uh, identifiers on their badges, yep. uh, people start stepping out of their geographic comfort zone and talk with other people and actually learn a lot. So much more is shared during uh, the break times uh, than in the actual sessions themselves. The other thing I wanted to add also, as you were talking about uh, the easy multiple choice of DISC, is that over the years, uh, if you look at the, the key questions that we ask, the 24 key questions where you uh, have to pick the most, you know, which adjective is most and which adjective is least, over the years, we actually do uh, a statistical analysis of which of the adjectives people are choosing uh, more often than they should or less often as they should. Uh, you know, for instance, if there was, uh, if we go back many years ago, one of the words we had uh, that identified an S was wishy-washy. And uh, we found that uh, people really avoided that. Even the S's avoided that. They didn't want to be called wishy-washy. So, you know, when you, when you see that, you update it, you validate it, uh, so that, you know, the, the, the multiple choice questions are as valid as can be and as current as uh, uh, the terminology that we use today. So anyway, let's move on to the next one. How accurate are the DISC results, Carol? Well, as you know, Tony, because you had to go through this, and is one of the reasons I never created my own profile system, because I knew what it would take to get the statistical accuracy, validity, and reliability established. That is why DISC is so popular around the world, because it actually is so accurate by your answers. If you say, I am most cold, they know you are least warm, if we were judging temperature. It's, it's a construct validity that gives people the, the results that they have given it. So the studies that have been done every year, I represented probably one, two, three, four, five, at least five profiling production uh, publishing companies over my career starting with Carlson and uh, now is Inscape. And I've gone, I, anyway, I've been with all of them. And they all have their own statistical analysis of the accuracy. And the most important validity is that people say, yep, this is me. That's the highest validity. So if you get a profile that somebody says that uh, it gets under the third point, the real test is, is it you? Does it represent how others see you behaving 80 or more percent of the time, that's the key. If you get a client that just says, this is not me, and you've had them check it with everybody that they know, and they go, I don't know who answered this profile, but it wasn't this person, then just call into your um, administrator, and they'll delete it off the system, and they can take it again. But usually people that says, oh, this isn't me, the reason they don't like it to be them is that it points out something they've been trying to hide or be uh, you know not been aware or or people criticize them for all their life and they just didn't want to hear it one more time but that really seldom happens I, I hardly ever get anybody saying this isn't me they'll say oh yeah this does have have um, accuracy so the only inaccuracy that can come is in the human error and they it's either time the focus or the objectivity and if I go on I'll tell more about that well wh why do they affect why, do, why does time, focus, and objectivity affect 
the results. Oh, okay. Tony and Carol, we actually have two questions that came in, if you want oh, to address right. them on that slide. So um, the first Back. one is from Jeff Lovejoy. His question is, is it easy to game the input? All right. Carol? Yeah, that's uh, a, go ahead. You can answer. You want to, well, I was just I was going to give a simple one. Uh, can it be gamed? Just almost anything can be gamed. But is it easy to game? No, it's not easy to game because it's not obvious what, uh, what answers you yeah. should pick for most and least. Uh, you know, when you pick a five-point uh, Likert scale and it says, uh, uh, the question is, uh, are, you, uh, are you a motivated individual? Well, yeah, you can easily game that by saying, you know, five yeah, the, all the time. Uh, but with DISC, it's much more difficult because you don't know what the algorithm is. And it's a very sophisticated algorithm, you know, based on most and least. And the reports that are done uh, are, uh, you know, uh, bullet points are pulled uh, based on uh, some of your most answers and some of your least answers. So it, it, it's very difficult to game that assessment. Well, the other answer that is that I learned early in the game is they've thrown in some no, no validity answers in the sets of four. There's some answers that look like they're popular words, but they're not really scientific behavioral questions, words. And people choose them thinking it sounds good, but they really don't add anything. They don't right. or decrease an answer. Right. Now, another question was, uh, how does DISC and MBTI uh, sort of correlate? Uh, well, as you probably know, uh, and many of you know, MBTI, uh, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, uh, actually comes out with 16 patterns, and they're, uh, each of the 16 patterns are a four-letter pattern, like, uh, you know, ENTJ. Uh, so, there's no question that MBTI is very good, it's very accurate, uh, but it's very complicated for the average person to use. Uh, with DISC, uh, DISC is more intuitive for the end user. You can actually get your report and read it and understand it. Uh, maybe a coach, uh, and, and I wouldn't even say maybe, uh, if a, a coach could add some additional depth of understanding in debriefing a DISC assessment, uh, but, but that's not necessary. Uh, but with MBTI, you do need a trained uh, uh, expert, uh, a certified expert yeah. to, uh, to debrief MBTI. And, and, and from a usability point of view, with DISC, you, you only have to focus on four styles, with M and it's dominance, influence, steadiness, and uh, conscientiousness. It's easy to remember. With MBTI, because there's four letters and 16 combinations of those four letters, very difficult for somebody to actually use it. Now, I will tell you that we do have an article that describes the difference, the strengths uh, and weaknesses between the two uh, uh, assessments, the DISC and the MBTI. Yeah, there's uh, actually two other questions came up as... Well, as I want to just want to mention one thing. The MBTI is psychological, exclusively psychological for behavior. And DISC is observable behavior and it's emotions. There's, there's a little difference between emotions. Even though it all seems lumped together, they are measuring different things. And, and DISC is self-assessment, not an, analyzed by somebody else. Right. Uh, now, another question was earlier versions, and I'm going to assume earlier versions of DISC had a reliability index. Uh, and I just need the person uh, who posted that, Jim, to clarify uh, what that is. You know, is it a reliability uh, index from the uh, statistical uh, validity analysis or, or what? Uh, and Jim, I've, I've made Jim um, unmuted. So, Jim, if you're able to speak up and clarify your question, be appreciated. Thanks, Tony uh, and Eve. Uh, yeah, Tony, it, it related the reliability index had to do with Jeff's earlier question about the gaming, because for those of us that have been around for a while, we've taken and looked at the disk 
you know, numerous times, and it is kind of hard to look at one today with the questions and not be able to identify each of the answers as to where that would place you. And I think at one time there was a, a reliability, I said one of the earliest versions I've taken, and I think that goes back to 30-some years ago when we were working together, <laughs> that it basically gave you an idea whether their answers were pretty congruent and consistent or whether there appeared to be some attempt during it to kind of modify and lean one way or another. Right, so I right. Guess, yeah, I haven't seen that in any recent ones, so uh, I can't uh, I can't tell you that. The reason that people like you and I and and Carol uh, and many of the action coaches uh, we we actually could probably game it only because we have seen it so often and get a sense of what the answers uh, yeah. would apply to. But uh, so uh, yeah, so gaming it from that perspective yes but but for uh, a regular individual the people that you coach who are pretty much seeing it just for the first or second time uh, they don't have that depth of uh, uh, experience with it uh, where they can game it let's say as easily as we can and the question really is who is this person the report is talking about now is this really you well, you know, it wouldn't like, be you if you're gaming it. Exactly. But, but that, the point is, why do a disc without wanting to know yourself? If they're gaming it, it's because they think the boss or their new employee wants to know, wants to have them a certain way. Right. And that shows up pretty fast because, again, authenticity leaks out. Who we really are being is showing up anyway. People know when you come in the room. But, it, it, you know, it's a high, that's a very high C question. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and and it will be, you know, reliability shows up in disk. We'll talk about that in a minute between the internal and external, okay? Can make them inaccurate. And I just want to give you the gift of how I tell people to do it and say to be objective of who are you really? Because a lot of people go, I don't know who I am. And these are hard questions. Well, they're only hard if you're trying to figure out what you should be. So answer, if a fly on the wall could count my behaviors through the day, when I'm in the role of X, what would it see me doing most and least often? If you can think of that and stay in the focus you've chosen, work, home, or social, you'll get very accurate answers, but you can't think too long. One of my clients came back, and he, he was in a telecall room, I, a company, doing some work with him, and he goes, this is a terrible profile. It's not me at all. And, and so I asked him a few questions. I said, well, how long did you take to fill it out? He goes, oh, 30 minutes at least. I really analyzed the questions. I said, go back and do it for 10, and let's see if we don't get better answers. And he came back. He goes, oh, this one is me. Yeah. So it's and, all and, in. Yeah. yeah, and Carol, uh, the, the way somebody answers it, uh, what their focus is, will oftentimes uh, – you know, possibly give different results because if Absolutely. my focus is is uh, this is how I am uh, when I'm not at work, or this is how I am while I am at work, or yeah. or, or this is how I am in this particular role. Uh, what really throws things off, though, uh, and what I have found over the years when people have said this is not me, was uh, when they don't have a clear focus when they yeah. when they're just answering the questions, not thinking about. Uh, what role they are playing or, or while they're answering the question. So really, yeah. that, that would be our next question. Uh, would, the, re, would my report results be different if I took a, the assessment? I, here at we, I have it at home, but it could be at home or at work or whatever. Yeah, exactly. That, that is the answer. And if you can stay focused in one, then you get a focus of who you are at work or who you are at home. But if you just say me in general, then you get it all over the map, and it may or not may or may not apply both places. So, right. yeah. Okay. Um, now, Carol, before we move on, there are a couple of other questions. Okay. Uh, so one question is, uh, uh, how reliable would the disk be to select candidates based on an ideal disk for a particular job? Uh, and I know you have uh, uh, some comments on that, Carol, because you and I have gone through this many, many, many times. So let me just answer it first, and then you uh, uh, can answer your your way. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would not use the disk specifically to choose a candidate for a job. I would say, at best, I would use it as maybe 20% of the overall uh, 
decision uh, making criteria. There's so many other things, experience and uh, uh, recommendations, et cetera. But, but uh, you can actually create, and we will have this for you probably within, certainly within the next 90 days, we will have the ability for all the action coaches to go into your individual account and create a benchmark. Now the benchmark can be, uh, and the benchmark is a benchmark for a particular job, whether it be uh, a managerial position, uh, a staff position, a sales position, and you can create uh, the benchmark by uh, many different ways. Number one, you can say, okay, if I have one employee who is so incredibly good, I wish I, can, uh, I could clone that employee to get other employees like that, maybe I'll use that employee's disk as my benchmark. Uh, a second way to do it is to basically say, okay, here are my top three salespeople who are heads and tails above everybody else. Let me do a composite disk of the three of them uh, and come up with that kind of a benchmark. Uh, and the third, which I've seen people do, is they would go in and, and answer the disk questions or the disk questionnaire, basically saying, uh, here's how I would want my ideal employee or ideal candidate to answer uh, the, the most and least questions, and, and you can create that as the benchmark. Then when you have candidates uh, uh, applying for the job, they would take the disk, you would match the disk from the candidate, the applicant, against the benchmark, and uh, actually in our system, we will be able to give you a report that will give you a percentage match uh, of that candidate against the job uh, benchmark uh, with strengths and struggles uh, that that person would experience in that particular job. Uh, and then you can take it one step further and match the applicant's disk. Let's say that you had uh, 10 applicants and three of them uh, came up high uh, and you don't know which one to choose. Well, then you can take the applicant's disk and match it against the manager or supervisor they would report to and actually get a, 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 a sort of a, a percentage match of the candidate against their supervisor and see if that can differentiate between the final three candidates. So anyway, I'm turning it over to you, Carol. You can <laughs> add your two cents. We'll, we'll do more on another call on that. Okay, on yeah, that. That, that one we could really, really get into yeah. a lot of depth. Well, we, we could take, exactly. Yeah, we could take a whole meeting on that. But yes, we will have some uh, tools for you uh, that will help you do that yeah. uh, pretty easily. Yay, so, uh, Tony. Yay, okay. Tony. I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> All right, let's, let's go, let's go I, into the next question that comes up wait, a wait, lot, I, Carol. Okay, oh. I just want to say that the clearer the boss is about what they want the behaviors to be in the job, then they can communicate that to the employee. And that's the value of doing a job profile, a profile on the job from a DISC perspective. So, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question is, uh, and this comes up a lot, this even came up on the last call we had with the action coaches, what about invalid or inaccurate uh, disk graphs. Okay, well, it, and different systems call it different things. They talk about this graph that I've shown as an example as a crushed pattern. Whenever you get all the points right around the middle, it means that some answers you said I am most this and I'm least that, and you were you were giving opposite answers throughout the test, so that the yeah. system, when you give it a D answer, it'll add one point to the D column and if you give it a low D answer it'll subtract one but if somebody's not sure of themselves they'll get a crush pattern or my experience was interesting I had some very qualified executive level people and they were all having flat patterns and I realized that as you mature into a job or know your job really well you don't necessarily have the same dynamics driving you you know the higher and lower a point is on your graph it really shows a lot of energy I'll mention this is an energy model. This midline is your energy. So if you're investing everything right about middle, you just are pretty moderate in everything. And so right. it, you could call that boring, or you could call it balanced, or you could call it. But as you pointed out, uh, Tony, there can be, if all the points are above the midline or all the points are below the midline, the computer cannot grab onto 
valid, constructive statements. That's yeah, well, Kara, what we call it, if, if, if uh, there's, there's three different, uh, what we might call invalid graphs, uh, it's called undershift, overshift, and uh, tight. Yeah, uh, and and all, okay. basically it, it's where maybe all four are just above the midline, all four are just below the midline, or all four are either above or below. It's a mix, just like yours here, uh, mm -hmm. but they're all very close to the midline. And what we used to do is we would have people take it over again. We would say you have an overshift or an undershift or a tight graph, uh, which is an invalid graph. Uh, would you take it over again? And uh, then they take it over again, and sometimes it would come back again uh, as, a, as an invalid graph. And after a while, people got pretty upset about that. So we, uh, we went in and uh, through our algorithms uh, uh, allowed people to actually get a report. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes yeah. it won't always show on the, on the, the, the circle. Uh, you know, oh, right, what we right. call the diamond. It won't always show their, their natural or adapted style if it's, if it's one of those three graphs. So anyway, uh, did you want any more on this? Uh, did you want no, to add any more? Take it in and again in another six months. If you take it two days in a row anyway, you can change the answer to be any way you want. It's, it's a matter of honesty of the person and awareness, really. Exactly. Now, you know, I asked you uh, back, I, I asked you, uh, would your results be different if you took the assessment at home versus work or you know whatever your your focus was now mm -hmm. what if you take it at different periods in your life mm -hmm. which is again what you were just alluding to so go to the next uh, uh, slide okay. okay so if you take it over different periods in your life will the results always come out the same yeah and the answer is maybe and probably but sometimes and <laughs> okay because, you know, it depends. Are you in the same kind of role? Are you in the same life you were? Are you married to the same partner? Do you have children now? Or didn't you have, used to have children and you had to be a different way? It's about attitudes, beliefs, values. It's the disc is a snapshot right now. And it gives you huge information about how you're seeing yourself in the environment, focus, and, and the attitude that you are right now. The good news is, as you think, so you are. Someone important said that once. Therefore, behavior is always affected by the decisions you are making or may not make and choose to, if you want to choose to change. So, so you can yeah. change it. You, you can practice and get into another style if you want to start to increase or decrease your pattern. Um, I had some clients when I was in New Zealand that said, we want to, we want to change. We're high C's. We want to be high D's now. I said, well, let's look at the behaviors, and they worked and worked and worked on behaviors. And they came back in three months, I think, and they said, okay, profile us again, Carol. Let's see if we change more D. Well, their D never even budged a minute, but their C went way down in style because they went from high attention to details and following rules to low C is, you know, independent of rules and making them up as you fly. And they thought that was being dominant. That was kind of interesting. It was just the way that they perceived what they wanted to be was really a little more gutsy and making decisions. And so, so much of this is human dynamics. And I say the profile is only as, as good and, and valuable as you use it to communicate about yourself or to understand someone else to manage them better. Another question that comes up and this is sort of a lob for you, a very easy question. Which style is the best? I mean, I hear that a lot. Which is the best? It's, of course, your style. Whatever it is that your style is the best one. And it depends on your attitude and your environment, of course. If you're being a leader of a company like Tony, you've got to play D. You've got to bring out the D in you. But Tony used to say, you, you used to tell people you were an I, Tony. I've heard you in talk. Well, I'm an eye, I'm an eye on the platform, and, exactly. and that is, I'm, I'm, again, I'm a D-I. I'm a, a capital D, a capital I. I'm, I'm <laughs> high in both, but a little bit more in the D than the I. Yeah. 
So and and he knows how to dance on the disc. That's what when people ask me what I am, yeah, I'm mostly an I. I never have profiled where I wasn't highest in my graph. No matter how many times I take it, I always get high I. But that's because of my value on what drives the I. Not the being loved and seen by people actually is my motivator, but it's making everybody happy. And yeah, Carol, I don't see you as a high I. I see you as a flaming I. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, and that's a good thing, right? When you yes, it is. It is. Oh. No, you're a lot of fun. That's what the eyes are. By the way, Carol, before we move on to the next question, uh, there's a uh, a question from uh, one of the attendees. Yes. And uh, they're mentioning uh, from one of uh, our competitors, uh, and I, I pretty much know who that is. Uh, they've received a report in which they. Uh, got the assessment, but it indicated that it wasn't valid and should not be used. Uh, is that the case with That's our assessment? Well, you got it because it wasn't in a flat pattern, and and they would say invalid. Um, right, and right. Horrible well, we word. used to do that. So Johnny, Johnny asked the question. So Johnny, uh, we again, we used to have that. We didn't even give them a report. We just gave them uh, an email that said, uh, you know, you have uh, what's called a. Uh, uh, a tight pattern or an undershift or overshift, uh, and it's a, it's an invalid uh, uh, pattern. So uh, you know, take it again. You know, basically what, what means, I said before. Yeah, there's only what that means is there's no one style they can talk about. Exactly, as exactly. Style. Yeah, it's not that, that it's invalid. totally invalid. It's <laughs> not like you're invalid. Right. Uh, but that is how people heard it. So. Yeah. It's, um, it's just one of those things. So that's a good question. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, so let's go on to uh, the question. This came up the last time, by the way, this question about the energy line. Uh, and, and let's go into that because the energy line uh, sort of relates to what we're talking about, and that is whether it's an overshift, undershift, or tight pattern. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit about the energy line. Well, I brought in these other examples just to show you. I'm sorry they weren't bar graphs, but they were in my system. So this is how Tony's system looks, as you know, with the compass. We call this the disk compass on top. But that's a whole different analysis. That has nothing to do with the, well, somewhat to do with the energy line in terms of the degree out from the center that you are. The higher your point on the graph is, the further out on whatever it is you'll be in the uh, circle. But the energy disk is an energy model. It's a, in fact, write this down. It's a needs motivated, observable behavioral profiling system. Needs motivated, observable behavior. So it's it's the energy of life that you're putting into dominating problems with the D, influencing people with your eye. Notice those are very different subjects of life, dominating the problem of life. A problem could be just how do I get from this chair out the door, or it could be how do I solve this problem with our competitor, or you know, problems are in all sizes. So a dominant style will prioritize life energy into solving the problem of the big picture. The I will prioritize in solving the the relationships between people and getting other people to team up and be better, you know, the synergy of teamwork. The, the S will be somebody that's studying the environment of the, of the situation, whether it's the office or the home. So the S, the higher your S is, the more energy you want to put into studying the pace. If you see a low S, like this particular graph is on this adapted Low S means they don't have a need for energy, excuse me, a, a pace, steadiness of the pace. They're more interested in moving faster. But this one, I'll just point this out because we don't go into a lot of detail here. But notice this person's graph is a high S, secondary high, but still high because it's above the midline. But they're scoring in their adapted. They're saying at work they don't do that. They move fast. So this is a conflict for that person, and we talk about that in the coaching session. What is it you're holding back in energy if it's below the line or pushing up energy if it's above the line? In the C, you're pushing energy up if you're complying to rules and details. It is a conscientious style, and I know people like to use that word, but conscientious is an attitude. 
compliance is a behavioral observable behavior that tells whether your need is to comply to rules or not, which this person obviously doesn't really care Carol, about the rules. Let me, they want to make let, them me up. Uh, let me mention something. Okay. Uh, the original term, by the way, is compliance. Uh, some people, uh, I've seen it used as cautiousness uh, or conscientiousness. I have found that when we originally were using uh, uh, compliance, uh, nobody liked that term. They, they did not like the word yeah. that they were compliant. Uh, right. So that's why we went to conscientiousness, but yes. But it's all about rules. See, the C is in the domain of rules. So how are you in the domain of rules? Do you park exactly where you're told to park? Do you follow every driving rule or do you not? So all of us, the point is here, what is the energy line? It's showing how much energy you are putting into dominance of problems, influence of people, steadying of the environment, or, and or complying to rules. Right. So these graphs just show, we could, we, they tell a completely different story. When you become disc literate, really, and many of you are, I know already, you can look at this graph and talk about this person even though you never met them. And, this and those, yeah, those are, the, the, those are a different kind of graph than we use now. Those were the original, original graphs. Yeah. Uh, but now it's we use the bars, yeah. yeah. But the uh, midline is always the midline. And exactly. And over below is all you need to know. And so this person with a high need for dominating, controlling big picture problems and the high S to steadying the environment. Now, just on the side note, this is what we call a me-me conflict in this person. Right. They're going to have trouble at some level because they're trying to move fast and dominate the situation, but they want to slow down and hold it in and make sure everybody's caught up and the support systems are there. So they have an internal need, and if you're coaching somebody like that, you help make them see that this is a, what, the, what is the environment they're in right now? Are they solving a problem? Then bring out their D. Are they steadying the environment, setting up systems, doing the, the support of the team, then bring out their S. So you right. can actually show them how they can flip-flop and not be in competition with each other inside yeah. themselves. But anyway, that's the point. So that all comes out that there's a lot more to say. So I won't say any more there, but does that answer the question, I think? If yeah, yeah. And I think when we go into the next uh, couple of questions, I think you'll you'll – delve into this yeah. a little bit more. But the next question is, what's the difference between graphs one and two? Uh, okay. And that comes up probably as often as any question. What is the difference between the yeah. two? Yeah, all it is is the difference in the, they, they came from the two different questions you're asked on the profile is most and least. What are you most and what are you least often? Mm -hmm. and, if, and in frequency of behavior. The graph that you said, I am most this, guess what that would be? Raise your hand. Let's do a quick little poll. What answer did the graph one come from? I'd say, no, I, I back Well, we can't one. do the poll right now, Carol. I can't uh, do it. All right. Yeah, but but, but, but yeah. as the way you answered, I am most, that's your adapted style. You're saying, I am most adapting in this environment that I'm in. Most often, I am being this. Your least answer came up with is what your graph two, your natural style actually came from. The computer does a Boolean logic to reverse when you said I'm least this, it turns it around and presents it as a positive graph. So you are most often in, in terms of your natural style, and this style as an example is a little more C and D, but they're how they're acting at work is more as steady, steadiness of the environment and friendly with people. So this person is going to have a little bit of a challenge if they don't get a clear with their boss about what the job is supposed to be like, what are they supposed to be doing. And if they're very good at their role, then they've adapted uh, well. But notice these numbers, and we don't go into this too much on this call, but here's a change, 73 uh, S for the external profile, but their natural S is much faster in speed of 40%. That's a 30% difference plus, right? Right. So right. when you're at a 30% difference between the same point on both graphs, that person is holding back 
uh, or pushing forward in that style, depending on which way it's going, you know, which direction. Right. So, hey, Carol, uh, yeah. you know, your next slide, I think, really, uh, you know, what does the difference mean, you know, in, in the two uh, graphs? Uh, and yeah. I think this kind okay. of explains it. So in this profile, I asked Tony to add these boxes, by the way, just so you know. He did a great job of adding these with the colors to show the the columns of words are giving you a literal description of the person. So if we say, what does the difference mean? You would say, here's how you are at work. Your eye is your highest, and you go over here, and it's up in about the level five, level six. You are charming, influential, sociable. At work, you have a need to be with people charmingly and influencing them, and your dominant style is being moderate. You're assertive, da da da, da competitive, and it, and your natural style is the same. Then you talk to the person. What does the difference mean here? The difference in the S that we talked about. That person is a having to work energetically and flexibly at work. But their natural S is way up here with consistent, cooperative, and possessive of the environment. Um, so that's where coaching will come in. You get in touch with reality. What is the need for them to be making that change? Is it accurate? Is it needed? I had one girl that was a super high eye naturally in her natural style, but her job was requiring her down here in a low eye. And she, I said, why don't you let that love of people out she said, oh, my God, she started crying. She said, nobody lets me do that. I go, what are you talking about? She said, I'm in a family-owned business, and my brothers run the business, and they just have pushed me down, 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 and made me forcefully hold back that talkative, loving, expressive energy. Hmm. And I said, let it out. And, they, and she just cried out of the relief yeah. of, oh, my gosh, I could actually be real and not be so upset and stressed. So... The difference just means you're holding back energy or reading it. And the disc, um, this word sketch, I want you to use that every single day you're debriefing. Lay their graph out on one page and lay the other page out right next to it with the word sketch and show them how and energetically these words change when you move higher or lower. This is where you get to be people literate right in here. Don't memorize the words, but memorize the context that each of these are in and how those word shift, and this is how you can help people coach them step-by-step into new behaviors. Right. Now, Carol, uh, before we go on to the last two questions uh, in our last five minutes, uh, just want to clarify, somebody asked, the least answers dictate your natural style, and the most answers dictate your adapted style. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's why they'll change when you say, does my profile change over time? Yeah, probably the adapted style will change if your job changes, your role changes, or if you take it, me at home and me at work on the same day even, you could get two different graphs. Right. All right, so uh, let's talk about DISC applications. Uh, where can people use this DISC information? Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. So I hope nobody in this class or anybody listening to this or in the influence of people listening to this will ever put their DISC profile away very far because the more you can use it to share yourself with others, the better your relationships will be. You'll be able to use it in your career choices. You'll look and say, if this is my profile down here, hi, I, don't put me in the mail room sorting mail or behind the desk doing computer programming because I'll be crazy. Um, I had a lot of people complain they were in the wrong job after they suddenly understood their profile. You use it in recruitment, hiring, training. Tony went into more about that, where you can actually match people's profile against the job profile of ideal. And in recruitment, you can actually, I use it to, I'll print a profile of the job, ideal job, or what, like Tony said, if you have somebody that's really great in a job and you want to replace them, you profile them then use words about that style in your recruitment ad. And so you coaches that are coaching the companies, uh, you can really help them and do a lot of work, help them do their work in recruitment by pulling out from a disc profile the, the behavior. Because if you put that in the advertisement, it will only attract 
those people that see themselves happy doing that behavior. People that don't like doing that won't answer the ad, so you cut down on your interviewing time. Management, of course, you can give, as I said, it's an x-ray of operator's manual of people you're paying a lot more to them than a machine you buy, and yet you study that machine manual to see how to operate it. And so the profile is a good way of a manager studying the profile so they really know how to maximize their people. One more minute, Carol, before I wrap it up. I think they can read the rest of the screen. Okay, right. so uh, let me put on the last slide and let me explain this to everybody, and that is uh, where to learn more information about DISC. Uh, because you know, even in this one-hour session, uh, there's so many more questions, as was evidenced by the people uh, who were sending in their questions to clarify things. One of the things that I, uh, I really, really like is that Carol has these free 75-minute telecalls uh, where a bunch of people from all over the world sign on and, uh, you know, Carol does this Q&A, uh, you know, m mainly from questions that are sent into her like what we did today, but uh, uh, is it live also, the telephone? Yeah. People can, okay, yeah. great. So, and it's at uh, http colon slash slash askcarol.thediskguru.com. So if you go there, uh, you'll find out when her next call is, and uh, I suggest because it's free and because it really gives you in depth about DISC, uh, you should uh, at least attend one, if not all. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get a little bit deeper into all of this, then I suggest uh, uh, actually doing a DISC certification, uh, uh, you know, uh, which could be one on one or one on many. I know that. Uh, uh, Carol uh, typically charges twelve hundred and ninety five dollars uh, being a high D and her being a high I her wanting to be liked and me wanting to get a good deal I twisted her arm enough not too much where she said she'll lower it five hundred dollars for my action coach clients uh, seven ninety five however uh, I got her to admit to one more thing if six or more coaches uh, can get together and want to go through uh, a DISC certification program with Carol. So six or more at the same time, it drops it down to five ninety five dollars each. And if you want to know more about her uh, certification, again, just go to caroldicehart.com slash certification.html. Uh, if you want to uh, contact Carol directly, uh, there's her email, carol at thedisguru.com. Uh, and uh, by the way, we have a whole list of uh, materials for everybody, uh, everything from slides, et cetera. The Platinum Rule, there it is, platinumrule.com slash actioncoachlogin.asp, and the, and the uh, uh, password is people smarts, one word. Uh, and you'll see all of the training materials that we have provided at no cost for the action coaches. Now, we had a couple of polling questions. Could you, uh, I, I know we're just, we're basically out of time, but uh, uh, could you put up uh, polling question number one just so that we can see what people uh, say? Sure. Here we go. Uh, okay. So go ahead and vote there on your screen, everyone. You can check as many of those boxes off. Um, that yeah. So how do, how do you here. use DISC? In what, uh, in what situations, whether it's executive coaching, which I, I, I'm pretty sure you do because that's what you do, but what about some of the others or, or basically none of the above? So. Uh, if you will answer that, that would be great. This will be a real quick poll. Uh, wow, I'm surprised that 100% of the people say, uh, or nearly 100%, team building and coaching, which is fantastic. Uh, so it looks like we can close these polls, and I'll share those results. There okay, you go. Okay, there you go. So uh, mostly team building and coaching. That's great. And uh, recruitment and selection. Wow, that's a surprise. Uh, Let's go to uh, poll number two real quickly, if we could. Mm -hmm. How many DISC assessments per year? Yeah, how many DISC assessments per year do you use on average, if you can answer that real quickly? Okay, I'm going to close the polls and share the okay. results. Okay, and it looks like uh, the bulk is 13 to 60, so anywhere from uh, one to five on average per month. And the last final uh, polling question, if you would. There are only three. Yeah. 
There we go. There's the last one. Which of these assessments do you use or would like to use with your clients? Answer all that applies. So DISC, the motivators, uh, a leadership uh, 360, a sales uh, 360, or learning styles. Which of those? And learning styles was the brand new one, correct? The brand new one that, uh, that you made available. Exactly. Pretty even, except for DISC. Uh, DISC is 100%. Yep. Excellent. Uh, pretty, pretty even split. Uh, now, were you going to uh, show them the link to take the learning styles? Because that's a new one we just put on within the last month. Or is that something they'll get later? Yeah, they've been all emailed. Um, oh, great! That okay. link and information, and I know you know that a bunch of them have been trying to go to it. So, um, in the uh, follow-up email where everyone will get the replay, I've included that learning um, assessment link as well as the free gift ebook that Tony wants to give to everyone. And then I'll also put all of Carol's information in there too. Perfect. And, and I just wanted to clarify that the, the DISC certification that Carol will do for the Action Coaches is DISC certification for coaches, specifically for coaches, not in general. So, but anyway, I, I want to thank everybody. And Carol, I really want to thank you. Your expertise is unsurpassed. I, I appreciate it. I've been going to you for now 35 years asking Woo! this question. So, uh, and you're only 36, so I mean, that's I know, unbelievable. I was, just, I was just a child when we started. Yes, okay. So, Eve, if you will uh, close it up, I'd appreciate it. And All Eve, right. May, I just yes. wanted to thank everyone. And I, Eve, would you put that last question up if they want to be in communication? Well, yeah, she, she will do that. Oh, that, all right. That, yeah. that's, that's we'll we'll put it up in the exit survey. So everyone, oh, when you exit out of this, We'd appreciate you filling out that exit survey, and I do have a question in there that if you would like Carol to contact you directly and be put on her list, then go ahead and check off yes in that answer. And um, we'll also be posting all the questions and answers in a nice Excel spreadsheet. I know that Ashley Wexler from Tony's company um, provides that to me after the webinar, so I'll be sure to send that on out to everybody as well. All right, I want to thank everyone for your attendance today. Um, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Carol, for all the wonderful information. I know that the coaches online, as well as the other ones that couldn't attend, but that will be watching the webinar, uh, will greatly appreciate all the information that you have provided. And thank you all again for your attendance, and make it a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.